Hello. Okay, folks. Hello. Good morning. Okay, good. Perfect. Perfect. The RIP code is six. <laughs> I guess we're just waiting for Heba or one of Heba or Ricardo to join in so that they can run the meeting. Hey, good morning, folks. Good morning. <laughs> That's not coming down that hard, is it? Give it another minute or so, and then we can get started. Hi, everybody. Hi. Hi, sorry, we were rolling off of, uh, I was just rolling off of our community call. That's why I was talking and not on mute. No worries, no worries. All right, so we have a couple of items today. So we have a Cube Stellar project presentation. Uh, Formerly, formerly known as KCPH. And then we have a WASM working group uh, discussion. So with that, I'll hand it off to the Cubestellar uh, maintainers or whoever's on the call. Okay, great. Appreciate it. Uh, let me see. Can you, I can't, okay. Let me see if I can get this going. I'm just switched over from, from WebEx to Zoom. All right. So I wanted to get off by starting off by showing you a little something that the teams pulled together. If you wouldn't, if you would indulge me, can I show you a quick video? Yeah, that's good. Great. All right, let's do it. Are you tired of adding your clusters to every management mm -hmm. console you use? Are you restless because you can't get your workload to scale vertically or horizontally? Do you need to clone yourself just to keep up with all the configuration variations and resource bundling tasks on your plate? All that frustration can make you cry. You need new and improved Cubestellar. With Cubestellar, you can satisfy all your multi-cluster configuration management needs. Deploy configuration to any cluster on any cloud. Hybrid, multi, edge, etc. Scale effortlessly. Centralize your inventory. Customize resources in easily defined groups. Act on status in summarized groups instead of one by one. Let automation tools do their job and return the responsibility of scale to the platform. Preserve direct compatibility with cloud native projects using common and unbundled Kubernetes resources. Warning use Kubestellar only as directed. 
Remember to exercise unabandoned joy as Cube Stella may cause feelings of relaxation, elation, and occasional outbursts of laughter. Running Cube Stella with your choice of Kubernetes distribution and your favorite cloud native projects may lead to periods of increased productivity and improved operations. Okay, folks. So that's, uh, I hope I hope you had enough popcorn for the one minute and 15 seconds. Thank you so much. <laughs> okay, well, th that was just an icebreaker for us. I just wanted to introduce you to our community. We're here to uh, serve the CNCF and uh, we'd very much like to be part of the sandbox experience with all of you. But um, to, to not get so far ahead of us, I wanted to give you a little introduction to our project. So our project is at uh, coopsteller.io. You'll be uh, uh, pulled over to, let me see if I'll just share that out. So let's get to coopsteller.io. Okay. So the project itself was born from discovering that there are plenty of limitations around multi-cluster configuration management for edge, multi-cloud and hybrid cloud use cases. So in particular, we started off with the edge use case and said, you know, well, what's specific and germane to edge use cases? Well, there's this item about disconnected operation. You know, clusters don't always have connectivity. So what can we do about that? Then there's large scale deployments. So if you have numbers of different clouds, numbers of different clusters, numbers of different objects represented on those clusters, workloads that need to get to those clusters, you know, we need to do this at large scale. And we know there's a number of Achilles heels inside the standard Kubernetes distribution that prohibit this. Things like object, uh, you know, object scalability in terms of numbers in etcd is problematic. Uh, that's for, for one, it, just one example, right? Um, small locations. So lots of times what we find is people don't always have just the average size cluster. It's, you know, it's all variations there within. So you could be running Microshift, K3S, you could be using a single node OpenShift. Uh, you could use a three node OpenShift. You could use uh, a Kubernetes distribution of any any like shape or form. And then there's different types of clouds. So we not only do we cover edge, but what about the sovereign use case, regulated clouds, things that need high performance like AI training uh, and stuff like that. And you know, of course, mix in on prem with all that. Right? We want to protect the crown jewels. So. To cover all that, well, we've worked, we've worked on a couple of different specific underpinnings or aspects. So this, this idea of having a placement expression. So taking what you want and, and figure out where you want it to be. So what and where. So that's really the crux of what we do. We, you determine what and where, and we'll figure out how to get it there, right? I guess that all rhymes. I guess I got to put that in the video too somehow. The scheduling and syncing interface it has to go to large numbers of edge clusters, large numbers of destinations. Again, when I say edge location, I mean something that speaks kube. And of course, there's gotta be this, this idea of rollout control that exists. Now, some of you may not have direct experience with this, but the, the idea of like uh, with large scale telcos, it's important that you don't take down an entire uh, region of, of connectivity for your cell, car uh, for your cell customers. And how you do that is maybe through, you know, these, these rollouts that take several steps to complete the entire operation. Customization, you know, you're used to using customize with a K, uh, you know, to affect Helm charts or other Kubernetes resources. We need, we need to make sure that that works so that you don't have to clone yourself like Dolly, right? And status for many destinations and status summarization. So again, harping on that notion of not cloning yourself like Dolly, if you've ever sat in front of a control uh, plane and you've tried to figure out how am I going to get this one workload to all my destinations, that can include a lot of typing. And the same thing is true from statuses. How do you make sense of four or 500,000 different statuses coming at you all at the same time? And so this idea about grouping, right, that you saw in the video and this idea of summarizing statuses on the way back, you saw in the video also. So that's more or less it. Um, so we don't think that there's a solution today that really has this range of, of coverage in terms of our concerns and the challenges. And so we'd very much like to be considered as part of the CNCF. We already abide by the rules and have some, some basic governance around it. And we'd like some uh, to understand what the gaps are for our community today and how we can start you know, knocking those down one by one to make ourselves a valid contributor. I'll take, I'll stop there and take questions.
All right. Um, so, um, have you applied for Sandbox? Yeah. Yes, we have. Cool. <laughs> yes, you have. You're right. You are number yeah. thirty-two. Awesome. That's why. That's why we're here. That was step one. Okay. Cool. That, now that that's covered for everyone, carry on. Neat. <laughs> Thanks, awesome. Dave. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, how do you? I mean, how do you run it? Is it just like a centralized? Uh, executable it runs on top of kubernetes or how do, it's a, there's a management plane or yeah yeah so let's get into a couple things so first off if you want to check it out for yourself please feel free to take the, the quick start guide you're in about three minutes you know during the course of this call if you'd like to just jump up there and take a look let me see if i can is there a chat here yeah there is okay cool all right hey thanks for your comment joe all right, there's the getting started guide and uh, underneath our coding milestone, here's some of the details. So let's get that also pumped in there so you can all share along. Okay, <clears throat> so, right. So we've got a number, we've got a, right now, you know, truth be told, we're right now reliant on a community called KCP. Now, if you know anything about KCP, you'll know that KCP has recently been divested away from Red Hat and Red Hat will no longer maintain it. And so they're looking for a new home for that. There's some interest in a couple of different communities to potentially take that on. KCP is a Kubernetes-like control plane, and we use that under the covers. Right now, we're making a move to also insulate ourselves against that major change. We're starting to take the approach that we will work with just about any control plane that's out there. So you bring your own control plane, we'll add functionality on top of it that it lets you um, solve for the problems that I just mentioned a little bit earlier using the the approach that I also uh, described. So the idea here is that the the standard person applies a workload or a definition of a workload over in the workload management workspace. And in there, they provide something called an edge placement object. And so these are all standard Kubernetes API resource definitions uh, resources that I'm talking about. We've added something called an edge placement object um just to give people a place to do that intersection of what am i going to send out to my edge locations my my uh my targets and where are those targets right and so we we take the what and the where in this edge placement object and then that pumps through a set of processes that we run a mailbox controller a placement translator uh and an edge scheduler and the first step is to go into the edge scheduler and take a look and see if the inventory has the location that was described in the where part of the API object, the edge placement. And if it does, it comes back and says, I got that. Let me go ahead and make up some placement slices. And then those placement slices are trans uh, trans uh, pushed over to the placement translator process. And that figures out how to deliver it to each one of the individual mailbox workspaces. These mailbox workspaces have a one-to-one -one ratio between the edge location, or what we're calling here in this picture, an edge cluster. And those mailbox workspaces, you can think of them as the um, where all the workload is held in terms of its definition, but it's not, it's inert, it's uh, denatured. It's not going to expand or execute right down that mailbox workspace. So we have this, na this natured and denatured objects sort of concept. And so right here, they're denatured. And then when the edge cluster does come online, so this is how you get rid of that, that uh, complexity. This mailbox workspace is how we get rid of that, you know, hey, that cluster is not online. That cluster is not online. Why is it not online? So this is the reason why that mailbox workspace that fronts that and makes and quiets that messaging and makes it so that there's no, there's, there's no trouble with that cluster, that edge cluster being offline for long periods of time. When the edge cluster does finally come back online, or it could be online continuously, it goes up, grabs its desired spec, pulls it down with something we call the Kubesteller sinker, and applies the workload object to your specified runtime. So that could be K3S, it could be MicroShift, could be uh, single node OpenShift, could be you know you, name your name your Kube and uh, Kube distribution and stick it there, right? So this is where we get the ability to be flexible in terms of size, right? So this could be as big as a, you know, a sovereign data center, or it could be as small, you know, with multi nodes, or it could be as small as MicroShift. So that's the that's the kind of the gist of it. Does uh, does this make 
sense or are there any questions so far? Uh, uh, Andy, let me ju just jump in. I think that the question was more high level and the answer is actually short. Um, yes, we are <clears throat> in an architecture of, as you can see what Andy showed, a center and we have agents that we call sinker on the physical clusters we are managing. So uh, most of the components are in the center, of course, that we can go to some Off. hierarchical- Off. Oops, sorry. Oh. Uh, hierarchical uh, uh, kind of architecture in which part of the center are, are in other places and so on, but everything that you see here are things that are running in our center except of the bottom right, which is the actual cluster physical cluster where we have our agent. And that agent is working in a regular Kubernetes way, uh, using a Kubernetes client, listen, watch, and all that. That's it. Sorry, Andy. No, Ezra, that was perfect complimentary, and I appreciate you that, with the support. Right. And, and uh, one thing that we need to emphasize, this is a work in progress, right? So what you are, Andy is showing here is the point in time architecture, obviously we are working very hard. For example, we all understand that, you know, one-to-one -one, uh, relation between mailbox and edge uh, is probably not scalable, right? We know that it's just uh, something we did very, on a very short time, just that everything, everyone can, you know, come aboard and work with that. And we are working now on kind of changing things here and scalability is one of the main targets uh, all the way, uh, starting from sharding for performance and so on, storage in order to accommodate for all, this, uh, all the objects and all the traffic. And as you mentioned, as you can see also in the internal architecture, uh, that's it. Uh, so we'll open up for questions or are there any other questions? Yeah. Thank you for I, that. I, I, sorry, I have. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I, I have a question. So if we, I want to uh, launch a service in this environment, uh, so where, uh, which uh, endpoint should I, uh, should I access? Uh. Yeah, can you clarify uh, what you mean by service? Each cluster. cluster from... so, so first of all, we need to emphasize this is not yet, right? We, we may be coming to that. It's not an as a service service, right? It's something that you, it's a control plan that you take and you deploy and Andy can talk for hours now about our one click uh, uh, deployment environment. So you are welcome to go to the site, to the site, download, and hopefully in a couple of clicks, you will have a working environment. And that's, you know, the control plan and on top of that or in that, you are, you can utilize it. Um, and it's running currently on it, any Linux, Andy, any other platform? We yeah, we, we cover Darwin and Linux. Yep, yep. So you got your Ubuntu Mac. Mm -hmm. uh, we uh, we do also <laughs> in Windows, is, uh, what is WSL? Yeah, we, we, we succeeded to go over all the example that you would be able to see in the, including bring up kind clusters as our edge cluster and so on, on WSL2 in Windows. Everything works perfect. <coughs> if you uh, want to just uh, try. Yeah, sorry. Uh, for example, if I, I want to, uh, you know, uh, submit a deployment, Kubernetes deployment, right? So uh, where should I create this deployment? In the central place or in the uh, edge cluster? I, I think that uh, no, you are working always again. If Andy can bring up the diagram again, we supply a, a, mul a, a, a multi cluster environment, meaning that you deploy into this, uh, into your workload management workspace. You need to do some some other stuff and all the instructions are in the instructions, but basically you deploy into the center, the workload. You also supply some instruction on your placement um, limit uh, restrictions, right? Constraints. And you also need to hook up your 
physical clusters, right? And we will do all the magic. Uh, eventually your deployment will run on your physical clusters according to your placement uh, constraints. Yeah, okay. so yeah, uh, if so, how uh, can we, you know, if we management dif uh, different cluster, the version may be different. How how can we handle the version mismatch? The the cluster you mean your edge cluster? Yes, the edge cluster. Yeah. So we, what uh, the the version of the cluster shouldn't make a difference. Uh, you're simply connecting you the cluster. The, no, and, yes, and you know. Okay, the API so, maybe also have some, you know, oh, I see. maybe okay. one field or two field maybe different. Gotcha. Okay. Sorry yes. about that. So um, that's something that we've only begun to explore. Uh, we've got some design thoughts that we haven't really explored experimentally. Um, so as you know, in Kubernetes, there is, uh, you know, some uh, negotiation on versions mm -hmm. or uh, flexibility on versions. So mm -hmm. the the point of view here that we're taking is that the authorities are in the center and uh, we're, we're trying to serve a customer that is both owning and the authority over the managed clusters and the authority over what gets deployed on those uh, ultimately to those managed clusters. So uh, first off, the, the, you know, the problem gets a little bit easier because it's not like a uh, independent organizations are coming in with independent uh, views. So um, that makes it somewhat easier. Uh, certainly an organization with a lot of uh, managed clusters has to worry about how to evolve things. Uh, and since Kubernetes has already you know, provisions for supporting multiple versions at one time, uh, you know, we expect that makes the evolution stories, you know, easy to come up with evolution stories that work. Uh, so the idea is that any one time, the center is potentially uh, independently for, well, there's there's some overlap here, but the, you know mm -hmm. the, we have a choice in the center of which version to mm -hmm. ask, you know, to submit to each uh, managed cluster, and of mm -hmm. course each managed cluster will generally accept multiple versions. So the general idea is, you know, this can be worked out. It's a matter of, you know, uh, posing constraints, meeting constraints, and you know, without getting into details and, and stuff that hasn't been completed, you know, that's the general idea. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's cool. That's cool. Yeah, and and yeah. I think that I think that this connectivity is, is an important point here. You can trick this whole system because one of the key points here is that it's kind of exposing pure Kubernetes, right? If you mm -hmm. have a workload that you successfully deployed in a Kubernetes manner into your single cluster. You don't, and even in Helm chart, you don't need to do anything. Just come to here, deploy to here, and we will take care about deploying to all the other clusters. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay, that's cool. Uh, 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 sorry, uh, an another question is that uh, I uh, do. Does this project will handle network? For example, uh, do, do they have some plan to, for example, uh, uh, some service uh, access across the different age cluster. So, so I, I think we need to emphasize here that at this point, this is aiming towards workload deployment and configuration. We are mm -hmm. not at this point taking care about, for example, the data pass or the connectivity requirement. Mm -hmm between the cluster for the workload. For example, if you have a workload running on two clusters and you need communication between them, uh, we are looking on, on some technology that are doing that and you may be able to configure that through our system, but this is not something we are taking care of, right? We are, working, we are taking care of configuring and deployment of the workload itself. So for mm, example, okay. we do not, for example, we do not at this point set up your physical cluster itself, right? And uh, like you can, for example, do with crossplane or whatever. We, we are not bringing that up or, or setting up the storage and network in the edge cluster itself. Okay, so that's another thing to follow up on that is you should be aware 
a, a project called OpenZD has just expressed interest in Coop Stellar and is working right now on integrating mm -hmm. Stellar and OpenZD together. So just mm -hmm. be aware that you should, you might see that on their YouTube channel within the next 24 to 48 hours. Mm -hmm. Okay. But okay. I do want to emphasize, um, mm -hmm. you know, the, the main point that Ezra was making, which is, you know, I, I do strongly believe in modularity. So to be utterly clear, you know, what we're talking about here is focused on the Kubernetes API objects in the mm -hmm. managed clusters and mm -hmm. not, you know, lower level or, or higher level or, or side or, you know, just parallel concerns. Yeah. Okay. No. So, oh, so boy, from my so... understanding is that uh, uh, this project focuses on uh, the uh, configuration of the workload for the network, for the storage, and then for maybe some others, it's, uh, you know, either dependent on the other project or either dependent on the uh, the physical uh, site or physical cluster from the, uh, for right. example, for the- uh, I, I okay, would just put it the other way is, mm -hmm. you know, it's, mm -hmm. it's the usual story here, right? The stay in your lane, you focus on doing mm -hmm. one thing and only one thing, and that makes you play out of the box with everything else, yeah. you know, hopefully, <laughs> right? Yeah. Um, so, yeah. yeah. Right. right, and as Mike said, we believe we strongly believe in modularity. So for example, as, as Mike mentioned, we are working you know, with the Kubernetes uh, uh, resources and API. So if you have a, config, a network configuration solution uh, like Submariner or whatever that can take care of you know, cross network and so on. And in order to set it up, you actually need to access the cluster, you know, apply it, it. We can do that, right? It's just that we are not the technology that is doing that work. So you can configure the infrastructure services if they talk Kubernetes, right? And if we can do that, but, okay. Okay, so I just wanted to point okay, that, that, yeah. that concludes our, our uh, discussion. I, I don't wanna make, be conscious and, and aware and mm -hmm. respect the, the time limitation that we have here. Yeah. We, okay. we came to the meeting today to, to, we had some expectation that we might get some feedback in terms of, you know what was required in order to reach the sandbox stage of the CNCF. Does does anybody have any immediate response to that, or is there a, how do we follow up on those types of gaps and how do we close them? Yeah, I think you have pretty much all the requirements. Of, uh, uh, I think there's some uh, requirements in terms of like. Uh, files that you need to have in the repo um, and we can send you pointers for that um, and it's it just i mean you already apply for sandbox so um i you, the projects will get reviewed in the next sandbox application review meeting and after that there's uh, a vote that lasts i think two weeks and if the project gets a majority vote from the toc uh, then it gets accepted into sandbox. The sandbox uh, application process doesn't doesn't have a ton of requirements, so you'll see a lot more requirements when you go for incubation. Mm -hmm. but we're happy to help you with that, and and you can follow up with us on the Slack channel. Or you can you can ping me. Will, yeah, so happy to help you. All right. Well, I, I want to say uh, thank you so much for giving us the audience today. We really appreciate it. We feel it's an honor to, to be in front of you. So thank you so much. Thank you very much for presenting. Thank All right. So, much. so Heva, you wanna? Uh... Yeah, okay. So let's discuss uh, the WASM uh, working group. Uh, thank you so much for everyone who attended um, uh, today uh, to discuss this uh, working uh, work effort. So let me uh, go ahead and share my screen so we can uh, start to discuss the charter, uh, the drafted charter, and then uh, we can go ahead and, uh, you know, like have a conversation related to the co-chair, technical uh, uh, leads and the members, and what is the next step? So uh, here's, um, sorry this one here you go so this is the document hopefully everyone can see it right now 
And yeah, um, yeah so we have uh, a great collaboration here to have uh, the document on, in a good shape. Thank you so much for everyone who uh, participated in that. So related to the background, I believe uh, um, there is, you know, like almost done with all the comments, but we can go ahead and make sure. Yeah, so, okay. All right. Do you wanna maybe kind of read the comment and yeah. maybe ask if anybody has any sure. objections or any anything that they'd like to bring up? Okay, so for the background, we only have uh, we have only one comment um, uh, from I Angel, and um, the comment is: I believe the statement may be confusing, uh, as may be interrupted the web browser since the WASM uh, spec stat stats there are no web specific assumptions. I would remove it. And the crest of actually agreed on that, and I agree on that as well. But uh, I, I'd like to to hear from from all of you if you have any comments. Otherwise, I will go ahead and remove it. Sounds good. All right, perfect. Um, otherwise, the background looks uh, looks good for now which uh, is just, you know, like specify what is the web assembly for everyone and, you know, like in the cloud native context, what we are trying to uh, to achieve here from, you know, like the presence of WASM runtime and the, the portability. Uh, going to the mission statement, uh, Ravi, uh, are you already in the meeting today? Double check. I don't think he's on the call, but... Yeah. Now, right? Yeah. So he has uh, uh, he had this comment, which is, I think uh, of uh, of running WASM workload in a cloud native environment. I think of a runtime environmental configuration such as networking, storage, WASI, uh, securing the workload, um, making the deployment observable, and creating a better developer experience. The mission statement for this work group should address these factors. While we have now that running WASM workload across a cloud native ecosystem. Okay, so he wanted to just to specify um, of, you know, like the, the statement that really, you know, like, you know, like target the runtime. Uh, which I'm okay with that, but I would like to hear uh, other people's opinion. Anybody has any comments, suggestions? Any any suggestion is welcome. Yeah. Hi, Ralph. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, we can. Okay, it's a miracle because I got a new machine, which means nothing works. <laughs> um, so I'm wondering whether you want to get too specific about being first class right away. All of the statements there are really, really good, right? Um, yeah. It that you know, I mean, like a mission statement can be evolved into it's what does that mean kind of thing. And what that means is definitely, you know, networking, storage, environmental configuration, all the details that Ravikant has, has said here. So while I think the comment is absolutely correct, I'm not clear that it needs to be part of the mission statement per se. It's where you want to go, right? It's the work you want to do. Exactly. So it's like uh, we wanted, you know, like the mission statement to to include or, you know, like conclude what, what you know, like all this stuff, but, uh, you yeah. know, like to, yeah. Like when we come to the scope and you know, like the you, like the success criteria, yes, we can, we can definitely you know like list all of them. So yeah, so like yeah. you know, I don't know where they would belong in this doc, but I definitely want to capture the the various parts of the comment and sort of like for example, the scope is precisely where I would think these things would be. We started with a couple in the document. And I would think the scope would involve things like networking, storage, security, 
um, deployment experience, observability, and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, I think some of those uh, aspects could be uh, uh, specified in the deliverables, maybe. So, and they, and they they could well mean something like that as well. It, yeah. In other words, like the the point is is it's just a question of where we want to address the point. I think the mission is just the high order bit, which is first class workload. Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, so yeah, uh, we will work on that. Uh, I will have this as a to do to um, refine uh, the deliverables uh, to to conclude all. Uh, you know, like these small sections. Um, all right, so for the mission statement, any other uh, feedback? Are we agree that the WASM working group focus on topics of running WASM workload across the cloud native ecosystem? All right, uh, I think there is another like couple of uh, comments. Um, Okay, can we expand the scope to edge as well? Yeah, I was thinking about that for a couple of days, but I think uh, it's valid, but um, uh, yeah. Yeah. Sorry, I'm kind of, I'm, I'm, yeah, yeah, I'm like please. Yeah, about, of course. about one, one paragraph ahead of you all. Um, for, so for me, uh, the way I look at this is, and I don't think anybody who knows me in our work will be surprised, but I think that WebAssembly extends the power of Kubernetes in all kinds of places where it's kind of hard to use containers only. Um, and so that does mean edge to me. Um, I think the way the industry, and this, this is just for clarification. And then if the point I'm making is persuasive, the question is just whether it's part of this document or whether it's just part of a, a larger conversation. Um, I think the, 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 the software industry over the last 10 to 20 years has created and its market understands language based on hardware deployments. And so we have something called hyperscale, which is considered to be different than edge, which is usually thought of these days as CDN. And then we have tiny edge and various other degrees of edge, which are also not CDN and not hyperscale. That's basically their only definition, unless you get deep into the, you know, the, the um, LF edge, you know, uh, map of things. And then all of a sudden it's all hardware definition. And the thing that I think is mistaken about that is not that it's wrong per se, it's that what, what Kubernetes and containers and WebAssembly all do is they provide an abstraction to use the same kind of code, the same potentially the same exact code or artifacts over all these hardware locations. And so it tends to collapse the way we have traditionally talked about um, cloud native is only hyperscale. Um, and I think that people involved in edge stuff know that that's not really true and it should be true, right? So I do think that it's really more about where Kubernetes can go with both containers and WebAssembly. And it's less about, is it edge, is it not edge? So I do think that we should include an expansive statement about where they can be. What I don't think it's good to say it's only, you know, I, I typically call it like, what is the cloud for the next 10 years? Well, it's not just hyperscale, right? Yeah, I think we can probably change, make cloud native, maybe not, it doesn't necessarily encompass edge or because I know the, there's an edge native uh, principles white paper. Sure. Which is that yeah. Not necessarily. So maybe we can expand on that. So I'm happy to, if you'd like to sort of noodle on some wording for the scope. If you think my, in fact, this is a great question for everybody. Do you think my, my way of viewing this is a persuasive way or a helpful way for people? If it is, 
I'd be glad to noodle on a phrasing for the kind of the scope part of this um, that is that is inclusive. But first, I want to hear from people to think that like the way I talk about it makes sense to them and it's useful. If it's not, we shouldn't do it. Makes sense to me. So. <laughs> Yeah, but, you know, Andy was just talking about things like this. Uh, Andy, yeah. um, others, how do you feel about the way I'm, you know, talking about? Yeah, you know, <clears throat> it's interesting because, you know, we have, if you notice a lot of what we talk about in Coop Stellar, we don't really, we, we, we talk a lot about state-based management systems, but, you know, yeah, Co Kubernetes seems to be the big kid on the block today, but you can almost imagine yourself, it's not, a, it doesn't have to be necessarily um, API types or resources that are Kubernetes specific. They could be anything, you know, at some point, they could be OCI containers, they could be, you know, WASM, um, WASM packages, et cetera. And so what's interesting to see here is, you know, the, this, uh, we see a lot more of that on these smaller edge devices, the potential for there to be more of a WASM estate. And, you know, I, I just have, don't have to walk more than three or four feet to see one example of that could be, you know, these HP printers, right, that we're bricking left and right because we can't use <laughs> cartridges. <laughs> By the way, if you want to know how to do that, I haven't published the YouTube on it, but I know how to get around that. <laughs> but um, if it, it, but I, I totally agree with you. I think this makes it a bit more, in my mind, it, uh, Ralph, it makes it more mainstream. And I think we need more of that type of messaging. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, it absolutely does. I'm like, I wouldn't use the word mainstream, but um, I would use more accessible and reusable yep. and shareable and portable to more environments. You like got that, of course, I'm I'm born as a I'm I now make my living as a PM, so of course I would use my language. <laughs> um, uh, Sten. Um. Yes, so uh, I definitely see Kubernetes as an, I would say, universal uh, abstraction layer, and uh, cloud is definitely more than just hyperscalers, and uh, I would say the main point you mentioned is when you look at the uh, cloud native landscape, there are so many edge projects right now already, so I would definitely include things like edge into cloud native, even if uh, the um, edge people try to differentiate it a bit and make it more, I would say, specific on their field, I would definitely say um, edge is included in uh, the cloud native ecosystem already. We could we could probably add the Kubernetes word somewhere there too. So because it, it sounds like Kubernetes probably ties everything together. Yeah. I, I, for and please, anybody else, raise a hand and and talk about this. This is actually pretty important to me, um, but it may not be important to other people. And so it's really, you know, I want to raise the concept. Um, the way I see it is there are limitations to Kubernetes right now uh, off of standardized hyperscale. And those limitations are not really Kubernetes limitations. Um, they're actually container limitations. And it's not that container isn't fantastic. Container is fantastic. That's why we use them. Um, but if you, ma you, you make it possible to run WebAssembly um, with Kubernetes along with containers, what you're doing is giving engineers choices to reach new places. And so I think it's going to result in an explosion of Kubernetes usage and scenarios that is going to be fantastic. But I do, to lift up Andy's comment, I do also believe that in about two or three years, if we're successful doing this, that people will start thinking, in addition to Kubernetes containers and WebAssembly, I'm going to start realizing that in non-standard environments, I typically think of them as heterogeneous or um, resource-constrained environments. People are going to sit there and go, you know what? Kubernetes is not even necessary here because it's WebAssembly that is going to be the thing. So I do think that from uh, three to five years out, there will be kind of a small Precambrian explosion and where people are schedulers and orchestrators that are different will appear in open source that will complement and not replace the, the reach and the power of Kubernetes. So that's sort of how I see that kind of thing. And we, that should be a cloud native concept as well. In other words, I love Kubernetes and what it does. And I think we can do a lot more with it. And that's why I'm in this space. 
but I want to make sure that it's the cloud native aspect of WebAssembly that, you know, make sure, not here, but in my own work, try to make sure that it's the cloud native, um, you know, future of both Kubernetes containers and WebAssembly and even out of Kubernetes in the future. That is, uh, the, I want everybody to be, just to be transparent with everybody. I see that kind of as a three to 10 year evolution. I see a hand. Thanks, and Mike. Yeah, yeah um, I just wanted to say that I see Kubernetes as really being two different layers that have different stuff in them. There is a state-based management layer, which is the lower layer and is not specific to containers. And then there's an the upper layer, which is about management of containerized workloads. And I see you know, WebAssembly as a, a peer to containers as a way of uh, packaging up and, and managing workload. Um, and so I don't see it as not Kubernetes. I see it really as, uh, well, it, I, I see that kind of structure. So I would not say that WebAssembly is opposed to Kubernetes. I would say WebAssembly is a, a growth area uh, for Kubernetes or maybe more structured words. I agree. So uh, totally agree, Mike, with you. So about um, change developer here to the end user, all right. And I think, uh, we are agree in not we agree now on the mission statement. Hopefully, we can just reward uh, you know like not reward anything, but just you know like uh, I think it's it's okay. We uh, we can we can move to the scope now. Um, so, Christoph, uh, uh see the previous comment. I think it makes sense. Limit the scope to server side wasm and. Uh, Daniel and Michael, perhaps we can also talk about WASM component and artifact repos. And Ralph agreed. All right. So this working group is intended in all topics related to building WASM solutions. So instead of solution, we should go with WASM. Yeah, I think, uh, yeah, I think that, uh, <laughs> yeah. there's uh, maybe an addition uh, regarding the artifacts, WASM artifacts, or we can add that afterwards, right? Like the repository of WASM modules, that type of thing. Uh, is like the sounds okay now, or? I, no, I think. Uh, I think uh, maybe uh, we have these bullet points at the bottom, and maybe we can add yeah. the work artifacts somewhere there, right? Okay. Yeah. All right. Somewhere. I mean, we can add it later. So, in the interest of time. So, yeah. yeah. And then we do have a couple of raise hands. <laughs> uh, okay. So, I think Mike. Mike, okay. Oh, I'm sorry. I just forgot to lower it. Uh, no worries. Okay, Angel. Thank you. Yeah, it it will be quick. So yeah, I was thinking that maybe the warning about building Western solutions, it could be kind of thinking about the three phases like building Western solution, packaging and distribution, which I think it covers the comment from Michael Juan about like the artifacts and, and actually distributing them for, for be run in these environments. I can add a comment, by the way, if you want to check it later. So, <laughs> sure. Yeah, please. Yeah. Okay. We'll do. Yeah. It's, yeah. I like it, actually. Um, all right. Uh, perfect. Okay. So, the next comment is related to development and adjusting the infrastructure, which is is it inherited in this statement that it includes? Um, the interoperability with other deployment types like containers, or should this be called out explicitly? Uh, all right, so we need we need a statement here. Uh, any you know like any other opinion related to that? 
Ralph, you have any? Uh, yeah, Ralph already, I think he agreed. Right, Ralph? Yeah, some sort of, I'm just saying that I think that Mikkel's right, that there, there, there should be a statement of, of, of hope for objectives without, you know, locking us into being, to having to deliver immediately. But, you know, um, that's absolutely an objective. I see hands popping up all over the place. Yes, Finn. Uh, I think integration with existing solutions like the containers is so essential, it should not be implicit, it should be an explicit point. Right, David? I totally agree. Um, it has to be the same. Uh, if it, it has to be the, you know, working with the same things or it's, it's gonna be yucky. Yeah, yeah perfect. Um, all right, so uh, I will just, you know, like to, for the sake of the time, I will just add like TBD or, you know, like for, uh, you know, like parts we need to work on and I will just move forward. Uh, the second uh, comment here about the development and configuration, this is the point where I see the focus on developer experience levels. Uh, yeah, I yeah the, totally agree on that. Um, so I will add TBD here so we can work on uh, adding the, the, the developer experience. Any other comments? Bailey has a comment on the chat, interoperability, cloud native environments. I was just wordsmithing with everything else that others were saying. Um, I think everybody's in strong agreement uh, about making sure that it's interoperable with existing environments. Sounds good. Yep. So we got eight minutes left. So if we don't <laughs> get through all of these things, we can follow up on Slack and yeah. also on the document. Right? So. But I, I like the discussion. Uh, I would love, you know, like to have, uh, you know, like more dis discussion related to that because if we had this solid, uh, uh, everything would be like clear after that for uh, coming, uh, you know, like coming uh, weeks, coming work items. Yeah, so if you're, open, uh, if, if you're open, we can pick it up later as during some other meetings. So if, if um, some of the folks on the call actually like to gather later, but. Yep. You know, it's also up to them. Yeah. So, Ricardo, uh, do you recommend to move forward with the co-chair and the uh, technical leads uh, discussion now? Yeah, I think that would be good. Okay. All right. So, uh, we got, uh, let me stop sharing. And we got a couple of interest uh, from uh, different people. Uh, thank you so much for that. And uh, we, let me uh, open the list because uh, I, I like it it's it's a it's a long list so um the co-chairs um we got uh you know like um uh, people who are interested uh daniel is it right is it like i'm uh i'm pronounce the name right it's daniel and david uh or ralph uh david justice uh or ralph um and uh there is who else luke luke from docker and robbie from bell so how okay ricardo yeah me uh yeah. so sort of uh co-chairs uh, amy ha she has a comment that we don't have to be super strict about the, yeah. the co-chairs i mean a lot of the folks can be leads yeah. but uh uh obviously you don't want to have like uh all the members be leads <laughs> so it's, it's more about like uh you know what are the the folks are interested in thinking about in terms of like accomplishing uh with that role right so uh if some of the folks on the call can actually talk about it and and basically you uh you know, make a make an argument as, as to why they want to be in that role, and and I, mean, I don't think it should be really strict in terms of saying that you can be in that role, but uh, but we'd like to hear about it. 
So uh, I believe uh, we can we can go ahead and you know like have have the floor for uh, each one of the you know like uh, people who wanted to be nominated as co-chair. And uh, there is just one, uh, you know, like one thing we need to notice here that we cannot have, uh, you know, like multiple, you know, like multiple uh, position uh, in, in co-chair from the same uh, company or, you know, like from the same place. So while I'd love to have like <laughs> lots of people, but uh, this this is like, uh, for you know, like for more people to, to have just, you know, like this fairness. So uh, Daniel is not here today, but uh, Karen, uh, I think you are already here. Do you have anything on behalf of Daniel to add? Uh, no, she didn't relay anything for me to share, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, yeah, I just know she was out today, so she couldn't make the call. So I was just going to take notes from today's call and bring it back to her. Yeah, so uh, actually she uh, sent me uh, like a, a very uh, small uh, description. So uh, I will just read it. I've been around uh, the Kubernetes and CNCF uh, communities for a while. I'm currently mostly contribute via Kubernetes Signal, where I focus on keeping the kubelet shipping and re reliable alongside the COCC. Uh, and she added, I'm interested in helping shape the direction of WASM work group because I think WASM is the best option to have for building safe and reliable systems going forward, both for building platforms for end users and for allowing extensions point for other critical software with clear boundaries. Um, and I, I really appreciate her, uh, you know, like um, feedback and, and in the document since day one. So uh, this is, uh, you know, like um, a, good, a good candidate as well. Uh, so I, you know, like we can move forward with David or Ralph. It's up to you. Sounds like David, because Ralph said that uh, he is tied up, uh, crushed with so many things. Thanks a lot, Ralph. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, did I accidentally throw somebody under the bus? Is that? <laughs> how that happened <laughs> uh so uh i'll, I'll go quick uh, because we have a uh, twitter office hours uh, just after this uh so um hi i'm david justice uh, i work at microsoft i've been involved in kubernetes uh mostly in uh, sig cluster lifecycle uh cluster api for for some time now um we uh so I'm also a uh, maintainer on uh, run wasi and container d wasm shims um, where Run Wazzy is a project where uh, we saw where we were going with WebAssembly. We wanted to make that uh, project feel uh, native in Kubernetes. We want to be able to run WebAssembly just like we run pods without any annotations or anything special like that. So that's that's really the intention of, of uh, Run Wazzy and something that uh, I am and the others that work on it are, are passionate about making that developer experience uh, wonderful. Um, I have no interest in the, the power side of it. I just want to help move the community in the direction of WebAssembly becoming a first-class citizen in Kubernetes. Folks don't need to think about it. It just works. And I think we can include it in so many places. It's dependency injection on like steroids. So we can just like uh, include it to extend so many different places uh, in the Kubernetes stack. I, I love seeing the stuff about the scheduler. Um, I think there's so many opportunities and I just want to help out. Awesome. Yeah. And so we can, uh, you know, like go with, I don't know, maybe, uh, I, I, it's, it's up to you, Ricardo. I cannot, I cannot call it out because I, I love them all. So it's, it's up to you. <laughs> yeah. I mean, so, sounds good. I mean, we, we in, in. Uh, David is from Microsoft, so and and then so we'll have some somebody from Cosmonic. Sounds like uh, oh, we have someone from Fermion, I guess, or oh, we don't have anyone from Cos Cosmonic, right? Or and we have some someone from Fermion, right? But then, uh, yeah, yes. you know, yeah, yeah. Bailey is from Cosmonic, but Bailey, we have Bailey. Yeah. Hello. Uh, yeah, I'm a, my teammate, Kevin Hoffman, I think was really interested in being involved here, um, but he is heading to a college graduation right now, so he couldn't attend. Um, 
but uh, you know, Kevin's been part of a lot of the CNCF projects. I'm also happy to throw my hat in the ring, but I kind of feel like Ralph right now where um, I'm acting chair on the WASI uh, subgroup and a uh, member of the technical steering committee for the Bike Code Alliance. Um, so I feel like that's probably too much influence. And I'd much rather have somebody else have the seat uh, like Kevin Hoffman, for example. Um, I think Kevin uh, maybe didn't realize he needed to send in his name. Yeah, I think Kevin's already there, yeah. Yeah. Cool. Uh, I think we have another org, right? Sven, are you you part of a different org, right? Yeah, like Sven, uh, right? Uh, hi. Uh, yes, I'm I'm part of a different uh, organization. So I'm uh, I would say vendor independent. Uh, so uh, I'm um, yeah lead software engineer at Liquid Reply. We are cloud native consultants, and uh, I would say we go what. We, we consult the customer, but the customer can decide on its own. So it's not a problem if they choose Fermion, if they choose Cosmonic or uh, whatever they want. So uh, I would say, yeah, otherwise I'm interested in developer experience. I would say that's my mon most interesting thing. And what's very important is in clear migration path that the customer is not locked somewhere in an ecosystem where they cannot move. Uh, that's the way, uh, or that, that's why I really love the idea to evolve Kubernetes with WebAssembly in a more open space. And uh, Kubernetes per se is a very good vendor independent uh, choice, and WebAssembly is so as well. So, since the, I would say vendors, kudos to all of you, uh, are working so well together. So, that's why I love the space. Awesome. Yeah. I think we have uh, enough names. Uh from different orgs, so we can move yeah. forward with that and uh, and continue working on the doc. And I'm not really sure if uh, folks want to meet again, or I mean, what if, or you want to continue working um, through the the document. So just want to take a poll. Yeah. Uh, so I think uh, just you know, like to call out Christoph and Angel. Uh, they already uh, interested in being involved in tech lead as tech leads as well. So uh, so just calling it out. So we can have like a very short list of, you know, like the, the people who will, you know, like um, uh, serve as, you know, like the, the co-chairs for now and TLs, and we can discuss this uh, further, if this okay with everyone. All right, so... Uh, <laughs> Yeah, so for the co-chairs, I think we have uh, two uh, two nominations, uh, you know, like two co-chairs now, which uh, she, uh, Daniel from uh, uh, Premium and uh, David or Ralph, I will, it's it's up to you. I think uh, David left, so Ralph. Okay, I'm throwing it now under the bus. Uh, <laughs> Uh, from Microsoft uh, and for the tech leads, uh, I I really admire Kevin. You know, like uh, he was like spot on, and you know, like he started to uh, to help out. Uh, but Bailey, uh, uh, it's again. Uh, I will I will just leave it to you. But uh, again, we can we we can have just one from uh, each place. So uh, and uh, Angel Angel as well, and uh, Sven and Christoph, are you from the same organization or? Uh, Sven and Christoph, you are the yes. same organization. So yes, we are. Again, so it's uh, up to you. Just one will be a tech lead. The you know like, but everyone is you know like uh, more than welcome to be member as well. You know like it's it's uh, it's not like that, but it's uh, just to make, trying to make to make sure that you know like we have people from different places so we can collaborate in in a better in a better way. So I will uh, send, uh, you know, like the, this list, um, uh, you know, like in the in the channel and here as well. So uh, let's let's start to get together, please. Uh, you know, like work work uh, work uh, with us as soon, you know, like as you can to have the document in a very good shape, and then we can uh, send, uh, uh, you know, like a doodles just to make sure that you know, like what is the right. Uh, the right timing for uh, our first meeting. Um, and once we have everything, uh, you know, like on place, we will send this out to TOC, taking their approval, and then we can kick off the first meeting. Uh, does this sound like a good plan? 
amazing. Okay, thank you so much for everyone who attended. Uh, hopefully to see you again. Yeah. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Looking forward to collaborating with all of you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. Bye. Great. Thank you. Bye bye.